glad to be here. Most importantly for all of you, my office is right near that door on the other side of here. I would assume many people in this room uh, know that the true person that runs the district, Brendan Denninger, is my right hand and it is a joy to work with every day. If there is ever a time you would like to sit down and talk, meet with me, um, discuss anything Milton or anything that's on your mind, I am open to that. Um, I enjoy that kind of, that part of my job. Um, that's how you truly make the, the hard times better is connecting and working with people. So please, you know, it's my privilege to be here. Um, I'm so glad we can use the high school to do this. Um, and I look forward to hopefully getting to meet some of you. Some of you I know, um, but for others, you know, please reach out. I'd be glad to sit with you and talk anything about Milton or anything that's, that's of importance to you. Um, we're here to serve the community. So, but again, thank you for having me. Um, and I, I look forward to today. Thank you.
So, but uh, he, he had an idea. Here's, here's his idea. He said, call it the Magical History Tour. <laughs> and I said, to John, I said, I don't know. That kind of makes me think of my high school days. <laughs> and you know, I was talking about Magical History Tour back then. And he said, uh, and by the way, we're only a couple years apart, so we're talking about the 60s here. And uh, I said, uh, oh, okay, history, uh, magical. That makes me think of the Beatles. Makes me think of partying. Makes me think of fines. And I said to him, I said, you know what? Do you remember what a $39 fine is? And he says, no, George, it's a $37.50. I said, no, 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 $37.50. Anyhow, so bear with me. If I look like I'm getting lost in my presentation, I am. I've rearranged this thing four times in the last uh, few days. So I'm going to try to keep this lighthearted. I'm going to try to keep it nostalgic as I can and not boring with history. Right? That was something that I tried to do when I did my books over the years or any lectures that I've been in. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Which Oh, wait, before I start, uh, I'm going to give a plug to the Historical Society for uh, maps that they have for sale, which we're going to talk about here soon. Several books that were donated to them that are for sale. And of course, the calendar, which we're going to go into more detail here very soon. So, here we are. This is 1956. Photo taken directly after the school was built. And you are here. Uh, I think most of you who are looking around the room recall that this was an auditorium. And Many of the additions were not on this building yet. The cafeteria was not built, and the library was rather large on top. And then when the additions were put on, the middle school was built, and then around 15 to 20 years ago, rearranged, there's a new auditorium. This auditorium then became the library, and that large library, this library was full of books. And this is what's left over after today's technologies. Every kid has a laptop and don't use books. So, at least I'm happy to know that over here, over the left, the bottom four or eight are my books. So, <laughs> I, I'm one of the 10% of the books that are left. <laughs> and by the way, you never know by sitting in here that this was an auditorium. Of course, it was much more. You had 300 seats, you had a stage. But can anybody look around in this room and see one thing left over from the auditorium? Right, up there. That's what the lighting was for the stage. <laughs> Anyhow, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the calendar. And what we do with the calendar every year is we just pick out random picked photographs that we think are not boring history, but nostalgic. How much more nostalgia do you have than Brown Avenue Park and Ice Skate? Okay. So I've had many people over the years do on Facebook, because I have these out on Facebook, by the way. And they'll say, hey, I think that's me in the uh, room there. I say, I don't know if you or not. Somebody else will come along, I think it's me. You don't know how many people have come out and said, that's me. And, Are you in this picture? I don't know. So, all right, uh, speaking of the schools, this is 1940 at what, the Rockwell Center on Turbot Avenue, which used to be the middle school. This is the graduating class of grammar school, 1940. This picture is one of my favorites that's in my books. Uh, this is taken by our Bishop Guru, famous photographer, 1929. And this is the girls' basketball team, girls' chance. And 20 years ago, when I did Chronicles of Legends, uh, Volume 2, this is in there, and, and I was up at the Arrowhead doing the book signing, and this really sweet woman came up, and she had a cane. She's, I'd say, you know, that's well, she was in her 80s, you know, and, and she said to me, Mr. Reedy, she says, I'm in one of your pictures, and she had her book with her. And so she showed me this, and she says, I'm the girl in the picture that forgot to wear her black stockings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the things you remember. <laughs> anyway, so that was very sweet. Next, this is just some uh, miscellaneous photos, you know, early 1900s bike riding. Uh, this is a photograph of 1935 banquets. This was when uh, this is a fraternal organization, the Moose Lot. We had the Elks, we had the Eagles, we had many. We had the uh, uh, Odd Fellows were here, don't But notice everybody wearing a suit. And that's what the expectation was when you went out to the 
fire, not the fireworks, but <laughs> up in uh, Allenwood, the Allenwood uh, where they made ammunitions, okay? So he was one of the haulers there. These are shoe store, you always walk in there, smell like shoe polish. <laughs> this is Harold Sr. and Harold Jr. Uh, in this photograph of their airplane. There was an airport here in Milton, I think as most of you know. Small airport for small planes. Another uh, college man and legend in our community, John Walburn. This was his, one of his first stores on South Front Street. Love this photograph. This is where Ghostbusters, I think, got their car. <laughs> that is, the one on the left this is a 1959 Cadillac, which they did use on Ghostbusters. So, that's a 1960 version there. Many familiar faces there. One of the far right being Ray Rue. And finally, we can't talk about Milton history without bringing up uh, world famous Chef Hector Boyardi. And this is a picture in front of Acme Markets, where I worked when I was in high school and college. Now it's the CBS store. So I think many of you remember Acme Markets. Okay, what's next? Oh, we're going to talk about the map. We're here, the map. The Historical Society of Dead would say the map. Okay, that's the map. And this is for sale. This is 1883. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Great Milton Fire. You all know what that's about. But this is three years after the fire. Right? 600 homes destroyed. The fire started up near ACF. Ended down past Lower Market Street. From the river to the railroad, everything here was destroyed. So, in three years, this town was rebuilt. So I'm going to take you in a little bit closer to a couple shots. This is Mahoney Street. This is uh, the Covered Bridge that went to West Milton. This is uh, the Trinity Church, First Baptist Church, Methodist Church, which was still under construction, and it didn't have its uh, uh, steeple yet. So <coughs> this is where Milton originated, first started, was Straub's Mills. This was a later version built, uh, Baker was the name. Limestone Run is here. Limestone Run is what powered everything here. And Milton Brewery was here. The first product manufactured in Milton, which, which it was known for then, was whiskey. And okay. there were many distilleries in this neighborhood, and there was a beer brewery. So, what they call the Port of Milton, uh, here on uh, Front Street, this is where they exported uh, much of their product to the south. And this photograph takes you a little bit uh, further downtown. This is Broadway. You can see here, uh, you know, it looks like a parade underway. Uh, on the corner is a small building. I know many of you heard this story before. That little building was picked up and put on logs and pulled up the street by horse and parked again, uh, which was became Broadway News. Okay. A little trivia there. So this is the, uh, the canal, the Pennsylvania Canal, the Reading Railroad, uh, our Catholic Church, which at that time the steeple was center. This is Locust Street. This building remains. If you go on Locust Street, you'll see, in fact, we just repainted it. This building still stands. The rest of this is gone. What else is in here? The train stations are here. Uh, and, and a lot of Broadway. This is looking uh, upper uh, North Front Street. You'll notice here, uh, this is Locust right here. The Shiner homes, there's three semi-mansions that were here. They, the bank was very close to the street. They, they filled this all in to build the three homes. Locust Street here, uh, this was another area of uh, development. You're going to notice here, this is the island, not the State Park Island what they call the Upper Island, Davis Island, which is now owned by George Walton. There's a home there. There was not a, much of a development there, but there was a home there. And when the Shiners built their home, homes here, they had a cable across there, and they built tennis courts over there for their family. So a little bit of trivia there for you. And taking further north, here's the canal. This is what they call the basin, the Great Basin that fed they brought lumber down, you know, from the Williams Court, the, the, the boom, to Clinger Lumber. Clinger Lumber at that time was a manufacturer. They made doors, they made windows, they made all kinds of products. They say that much of the, that town was repainted.
built in 1880 from lumber from Greater London. Also, the lumber fed the, uh, the ACF, and they made the, the tank cars in the wood. And you'll see the one that we have downtown. Thank you, Historical Society, for getting that. Here is Lincoln Street School. This is Lincoln Street. Here's some trivia for you. If you go on 4th Street, and if you get into a dead end here because you're running into an ACF building, actually, that is a road that crossed the canal over a bridge. This is the front of Milton Cemetery. If you go up to Milton Cemetery, you'll see that this is the front of the cemetery. Golf Course Road is back here, and it does actually look when you drive by, it's the back of the cemetery. The front of the cemetery's main entrance was here. I, I can't blow this up, but there's a gazebo right here. There's all, this was very ornate in here. So after you're done today, the weather's nice, go up there and see what you see. I've been there many times. So now we're going to talk about Chronicles of Legends of Milton. These are books I wrote back in 2002, 2003. Uh, basically, I don't know when I got the urge to do this. I'm not a historian, I'm an engineer. And, uh, but I just had this passion for wanting to understand Milton history. And uh, then uh, I'm going to go on to uh, the book was dedicated to my parents. My parents came here from Greece, they were Greek immigrants. Uh, they were very proud of the Americans, and I dedicated to them uh, coming here to live the American dream. The book is also a memory of William Hastings, Fred Hastings, and Charlie Johnson. Charlie Johnson took over as editor of the Standard after Fred Hastings. Now, this is a very important part here because what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this lecture is going to be a lot of light humor from Fred Hastings, okay? So, anyhow, at the acknowledgments here, I thank the Standard Journal, I thank the Historical Society, I had Nancy Minnick help me with publishing, I had Bill Ralph, Ray Leeser, Homer Folk, a number of different folks. Again, thank you very much. Here's a table of contents for Volume 1. We talk about early Milton history, the Great Milton Fire, major businesses, and so on. Uh, we talk about downtown, Agnes Mud. And then in Volume 2, it's kind of like everything that was left on the on the, uh, <laughs> the leftovers from one, I put into two, so it's more of a backfill, if you will. But I came across working with Kate Hastings. I think most people know who Kate is, Dr. Kate Hastings, professor at Susquehanna University, but her father, Bill Hastings, uh, and her uncle Fred, of course, owned the Standard Journal. Not, well, now called the Standard Journal, it was the Milton Evening Standard. <coughs> okay. Anyhow, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the last couple of words in volume one, uh, which segues into the first couple of words in volume two. First, this is one of the last paragraphs in volume one. We're talking about <coughs> Milton Historical Society. Uh, I don't expect anybody to read these, by the way. <laughs> it's not that good. Milton Historical Society is an outgrowth of West Branch Canal, Canal Society, founded by Dr. Sidney Davis II. The Society's Museum, the Cameron House, located on Urban Road, Milton, was opened to the public on December 13, 1981. The historic landmark is named for James Cameron, who once owned the Fretwell style farmhouse in the mid-19th century. When the Hammer Cameron House was acquired by the Society, it was almost in its original state, and a long one-story eight-bay garage was added to the rear when the structure was used by the state police. Motorcycles were kept there. The house is a two-story brick building with finished attic and many spacious rooms. Nearly half an acre surrounds the house. William P. Hastings, publisher, said, oh, wait a minute. Over the years, many contributions and fundraising events helped restore the structure. Most significant, however, was the initial acquisition of the Cameron House that was purchased and donated to the Milton Historical Society by the Standard Printing Company. William P. Hastings, publisher of the Standard, is proud to be a part of providing a focal point of the roots and the traditions of our community and of its historical treasures that we otherwise be dissipated or lost to posterity forever. The building itself is only a nucleus. It must be a community-wide project to restore it to its pristine grace and charm and to collate the things that will give us all remembrance of things past. And you know, and I read that and I thought, okay, I put this in the book and I, I was, remember some things passed and doggone it. I said, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to bridge the two books. The first four words of the new book for me is all remembrance of things past and we have remembrance of things past. And what is that? That is the title of a special series of 
articles appearing in the Milton Standard written by Fred G. Charles Hastings, editor of the Standard from 1910 to 1956. Fifteen years after his retirement from the Standard, he wrote about his youth at the turn of the 20th century. Basically, the series was about the people, places, and events of his hometown, Milton. At the time, readers acclaimed it to be the most popular feature ever published by the Standard. And so he goes on to write in 1971, Since I was a little boy 75 years ago, which would be the late 1800s, I have seen most of the conveniences and necessities of present-day living come to, to be. Many of these things teenager boy today takes for granted and probably believes always existed. I have watched the airplane, radio, and TV since their beginning, and have seen the automobile and telephone develop from devices for the very wealthy to become something of part of every day. And so, I have a little blow up here. This is Fred Hastings at his office at the Standard of Art Street, 1940, and he was the editor of 1910 to 1956. And uh, this is 1944. Um, by the way, anybody know where this is? This is the second location of the standard. The first location was on Broadway, number 9 Broadway, I believe. Look at there. This is the Stettler Hotel Bar Room, which is now Speedy's. That's where the standard was before it was here in town. Anyhow, so we're going to go on to talk about. I was planning to read, do a lot of reading. I think I'm going to not read as much as what I thought I was going to originally. But here what we're going to talk about is transportation between Lewisburg, Milton, and Watsontown for the L M and W trolley line. And he writes, the trolley was a great boon and for lovers. And before fares were raised from five cents, for the trip between towns, a boy could take his best girl for a two-hour ride to both ends of the line without floating alone. <laughs> and he says, as dancing and, and gained popularity and favor, when it looked at though dancing at the park was going to last forever, uh, it was open to the public with great fanfare and frisky winter back and his six piece or orchestra played almost every night. I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, teenagers of today will panic when they learn that nice girls of that era wouldn't dream of going to the park without an escort or without a chaperone. And then in parentheses he says, we never really asked the nice girls about this, but we can vow for the president. We are pretty certain the chaperone is a bit different. So, anyhow, so he talks about the many different dances they had and, and so forth. So, he says here, um, if a boy went to the park alone, he could get through the evening for a dime. Five cents up and five cents home. If he took his girl, it was 20 cents. And if he could wangle another dime, it meant an ice cream soda at intermission. And this was the days when the nickel talked big and paid for the car fare <coughs> and bought a soda. So, anyway, we hear stories about Riverside Park, which was located uh, right about where the Red Bridges are. This was owned by the trolley company, the LNW. Uh, was based in Locust Street, Milton, went to Lewisburg, went to Watson Town, and in many communities these parks popped up as being a destination to justify the existence of the trolley lines. Okay, so that's uh, Rolling Green Park, for example, in, uh, in Sealage Grove. That's owned by the local trolley lines. This is uh, right underneath the Route 80 bridges was this building. This was uh, their dance hall. And there were other different buildings in the area of uh, recreation. This is Winterback's Orchestra, number of names here, but that's pretty cool. Next, he talks about the automobile and his kind of thought of comedy here. The end of the trolley car was hailed by at least one big group of citizens, the owners of radio sets. The worn out trolley car with faulty wire started to foul up radio programs when the cars were a quarter of a mile away and continued to harass listeners with a roar that sounded like Niagara Falls until they were a quarter mile on the other side and didn't need much good listening. So anyhow, he goes on to talk about the different cars that were in Milton at the time. Uh, the Lotus up. This is Buick's. This is the Sears family. Uh, Sears Buick Garage was located where 
on South Front Street where the Oakland Motorsports is now. Before that, it was the uh, Conan Fair. Before that, it was the Buick Garage. On the following page, this is Covers Garage, Ford Motor Cars. This building was originally the uh, National Guard uh, Station, Armory, excuse me. And uh, this would be Upper Market Street. In front of here, over in this area, would be Charlie's Pedal Talk. So that building is no longer there. Uh, it's an empty lot now. Next, he goes on to talk about, oh gosh. Activities of the boys in the wintertime many years, including trapping for muskrats. This was one of my early business ventures, and I had quite a string of traps. The traps cost 35 cents, and a good muskrat pelt would bring in 17 cents. When I was a boy of 10 or 12, I got up hours before daylight, put on two pairs of pants and extra outer clothes, and went to the river to examine my trap. Set as likely spots around the Upper Island. The Upper Island he's talking about would be not the State Park, but the one to the north. And so, uh, amusement for young people in the early 1900s is where they, they found it. It was the days before radio and television, the most popular place in town, structure for young was the Bijou Cream on Broadway. And of course, those days were talking movies. The price was five cents to go to the movies. So I'm going to blow up a couple of these photographs so you can see. As far as I know, this is taken from Lincoln Park, and this would be the Milton West Milton Bridge. Three versions prior to the one that's there. This would be the, uh, the railroad bridge at the southern end of the island. Take notice here, we have canoes, we have flat boats. Why this man is dressed in a suit, I'm not sure. I don't think he's going to get up on his boat. Maybe he is. Thank you. 
taken. They say it's the last canal boat leaving Milton in 1904. And this is taken from the bridge on 4th Street where you're leaving Lincoln Street School heading to the bucket to the cemetery. That photograph is taken there looking south. This would be the canal basin. This is the canal. Canal boats, of course, you know, drawn by you. So he, uh, he goes on to talk about uh, uh, different, uh, this is funny. One of the proudest moments of my life was when I probably was in my early 20s and I was named the representative of the first ward of Milton Borough Council. One of the three members representing the ward had resigned and his successor was to be elected at the next council meeting. I was there to cover the meeting for the standard and during the discussion Mr. George Scheimer, member of the second ward, said, there's a young man here who would make a great member. I will be elected. He says, and I was a councilman. So, at the, time of the chair, at the time, the chairman of the fire committee in the council was chief of the fire department. And I inherited that job, serving as fire chief for a number of years. I remember one night there was a bad fire in the southeast section of Milton. We had to pump water from down the hill, a block away. By the time the fire was out, most of us were soaked to the skin, and the temperature was below zero. When I went home about daylight, my clothes were frozen stiff. Two days later, I had tonsillitis in the Quincy. The late Kenneth Wisher, immediate past president, who served well in the capacity for many years, never would quite believe I ever was chief of the fire department. He said, you chief of the fire department? Never, he would say. And I never could find anyone who remembers that. <laughs> so, and then, oh God, he's so funny. Next, we're going to talk about uh, something else that they did at the Standard. The present day sports fan who sits comfortably at home and watches his favorite sports unfold before him doesn't realize how fortunate he was compared to his counterpart a half century ago. Covering the World Series, baseball games, elections, and big five prize, prize fights was a major achievement for the smaller newspaper then. At the World Series time, national election time, and all big prize fights, the Standard had Western Union installed telephone telegraph lines into our office, and the public was advised that the latest news would be thrown on a screen in front of the office or would be relayed by megaphone. And to get the results of the fight after each round, the score would be in series game, half inning, latest fights. The crowd would fill Arch Street from Broadway to Walnut Street, and traffic would stop. And uh, that was how the entertainment got around from the standard. Okay. So, on this area here, he goes on to talk about Wallace Fetzer, <clears throat> and he, uh, he mentions here before uh, the teletype machine, uh, the central sending, there was a central sending station from uh, Pottsville. The Standard, Sunbury Item, and three other papers were on the same circuit. In the course of his duties, this editor talked about himself. Your writer had the story of World War I told to him over the phone from the beginning of the war to the end. And most men can look back and think about who their rival was at that time and said mine was Colonel Wallace Fetzer. And he said, the War Department of Washington released daily calculate lists which were sent directly to the editor of every paper in the country several days in advance. The editor was warned that if any part of the list was made public before the release date, his paper would be taken off the department mailing list. And so for three days before it became known, your writer carried a message inside his coat pocket. For three days, the Colonel Fetzer had been killed in France by an explosion. And the news of his death was not made public until August <coughs> the 20th. Nearly a month later, this man had to keep this to himself. So when the American Legion was born, they named the uh, the Legion in his honor. You'll see here Wallace, a uh, World War I hero, was a 1980 graduate of Milton High School at Bucktown University. Uh, his career in education led to his appointment as superintendent of Milton Schools. And by the way, there's a large plaque. And when you leave today, go up the steps to the left and see the appropriate size plaque in his honor. <coughs> this is another photograph. Who knows where? This is 1936 uh, in a parade. Uh, picture of the unknown soldiers. Here's some more neat photographs from downtown at that era. Uh, 
this is taken in front of the Miltoni building on South Front Street. Uh, uh, I don't know who they contracted to do these things, but whenever you see these big parade photographs anywhere in Milton, especially, they would have these, these large decorations. This was the uh, uh, welcome from somebody for something, I don't know. This says up here, IOF, this would be the Oddfellows Hall, some kind of celebration for them. This is looking from Center Street North. This is uh, uh, South Front Street. This is the YMCA building at that time, all decorated up. And here you can see, this is pretty cool, this is the emergency exit system. There was a rail across the top of the building with a ladder. This ladder went up and down, right? And then the ladder you would roll wherever you wanted to go. So I don't know if you're down here and you're on fire, Pinkish, pinkish 
brown at the top, but the hotel, it was black up here. And, and I don't know why I remember this, but I do. So they removed Hotel Hay and it came under different names. And for those of you who are not, that's where M&T Bank is now. <clears throat> this is, uh, of course, Ron, uh, that the hotels had, Huff Hotel was one of the many hotels in town. And then he goes on to talk about the uh, Great Local Fair. Uh, and you know where that was? That was northern town where the driving range is. Uh, golf driving range. <laughs> Different photos from there. And so, I timed this just about right. Um, I have many more things to show off, but I won't go into them. And I'm going to leave it there. So, uh, that's just uh, some basics about the history of Milton. Oh, thank you, dear. Am I with Kathy? <laughs> Put up now, don't forget to uh, support the Historical Society. There's calendars and there's these maps. Uh -huh. you, you're going to stare at this map forever. This is worth the money, Pat. you got to have this map. And they have books for sale. So, that's the Chronicles and Legends of Milton. I could be here for the next two weeks talking about the other 12 chapters in this book. But there's so many fascinating things about our community. And I really do. I enjoy looking at the nostalgia part of the whole thing, not just the dry history. So, again, thank you for your time. Any questions? Oh! Yes? Oh, okay, we want to we plug some resources. There's a handout that you got, MiltonHistory.org. And then, if you have your phones with you, because we don't use books anymore, don't forget, is that look at MiltonHistory.org. There's hundreds and hundreds of photographs of Milton. Uh, and many maps, the Sanborn maps, and, and, and like this, this map is in the up that I showed you, which is really neat, but Larry did, it was a great service to our community. You can go in there and you can zoom in on that map I showed you, and you can really get close to, to the details of everything that's in there, so look that up. Yes, sir, Buzz. If you're really interested in trolleys as you leave town and go, just before you get to Lewisburg where the underpass used to be, you can still see the riser in the earth where the trolley would go up to get on the train bridge. Yeah. That piece of ground is still there. It, it is, you're right. That must be quite the fee as well. I have a... Uh... No, I'm not going to go anymore. Anyhow, any more questions? Not, not a question about just a story. When I was a young chicken noodle and I moved out of my parents' house and ran an apartment, I rented an apartment in the back of what was then engineer drives, which I didn't know, but I had a large storage room right off my bedroom. I opened the door to that, and I looked up, and there was a pair of rings hanging there. And I thought, what in the world is this? Then I found out that's where the original YMCA is. And I still wonder to this day whether those rings are still hanging from the rafters <laughs> in that building above the place crash or not. But they are. When you go in with your taste crash poppy, ask them to take you back, yeah. take you up into a crawl space up on the top, and you can see the top of the gymnasium and the rafters and the walkway that goes around it. Yeah, that, and that was my storage room. I could keep anything there. <laughs> I was an art teacher, so believe me, I had a lot of stuff to store there. Furniture from Mifflinburg is moving in. The, the Time Organization has entered into a creative lease uh, on that whole block, more or less, uh, through some uh, grants that we receive. We're in the process of buying everything, but we've already started to gut the exterior of it, and we took off the front of the J.J. Newberry's in the grant store, which we put on in 1965, we tore that off. We found all kinds of stuff. And then next to what used to be the library, which is now the art. Art bank. Hey, we tore the front of that off. We found this beautiful mosaic tile. I mean, really, this stuff is all over downtown. We're doing everything we can to restore our community to the way it was. So, anything you can do to help us with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, George, oh, hi, Mike. Hi. hi. Uh, most towns have one Market Street. What's the deal with Upper and Lower Market Street, and why there? The okay, market? I can tell you that. If you look at your uh, handout I gave you, you'll see that there was uh, Andrew Stroud bought in 1790 a piece of 125 acres from the Turbot Estate, all right? Mm -hmm. 
That was at Broadway. So his lot was from Broadway to Ferry Lane, 125 acres. <clears throat> North of that Broadway was uh, Black, James Black. He was a Sunbury investor. He bought another 100 some acres from the Turbot uh, estate. And so there was Lower Milton and there was Upper Milton. And if you look at these older maps, and I'm not going to bore you with that again, but if you look at these little maps, Lower Milton had a 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, and Upper Milton had a 1st Street, 2nd Street, and they had Market Street. So, I think it was maybe in the late 1800s, the Borough Council renamed a lot of the streets, all right? Uh, I think Garfield Avenue, as we know it now, was 3rd Street. And then, uh, oh, I know. What we know is Arch Street, north of Broadway, was... Black called that Front Street, he called Front Street Water Street, and then Stroud, his Front Street was called Front Street. Right. That was really crazy mixed up, but if you take notice, if you go from Broadway South, the layout of the streets are totally different than they are from the layout of Broadway to the north. Now, I'll give James Black credit. He laid his town out in a grid, okay? Whereas, if you go downtown, you know, south of Broadway, it's, you know, streets are all over the place, but that's the explanation for that. Right, yes. You were saying about the orchestra that played. I misunderstood. It was 60-piece orchestra, and were they all local Milton people? I think they were all local Milton people, and yes, they were. Uh, you know, I've, in many different things I've read, they were apparently pretty popular. Yeah. Oh yes, John. Uh, John Marr might be able to answer this. One of those ice wagons that were in the picture sits 40 years ago was still sitting in a barn out at Limestoneville. Ed Reister's barn. I stacked hay in there and it was one of the Milton ice wagons. I would guess it's still there. I don't know. You should buy it, John. And restore no, it. I got no room at the end. No room at the end. <laughs> Come on, John. Come on. Michelle. Yes. Hi. You do know that you own. The society owns the ice fishing equipment from the Strasser, or the, um... Stroud? No. Sadison. Sadison family. Oh, oh, oh I didn't know that. Did uh, where's Ron? Ron? We have about 25 pieces. Oh, okay. All right, well, that's very nice to know. It was used as the first exhibit at the Packwood House Museum in Lewisburg. I see. When it was first opened. David Dunn was the curator there, and he uh, set up a display using that equipment. Interesting. So, you Thank you. That. You okay. thought uh, that was given to the society. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have a nice wagon to go with it. What if he told me he was here for a reason? What is your reason? The last year and a half, I published three books on my life, which also pertain to our town. I graduated in 2006, the same year your daughter graduated. Okay. And that 2006, Pluto left our solar system. Okay. Last year, I'm not sure if many of you know, Pluto came back to our solar system. And I took photos in the last year and a half, so 8,000 or more, not only of our town, but also of Pluto as well. I so see. Before I knew it was even Pluto. Okay. So I'm here for a reason. Oh, good for you. Well, you should put your, uh, your 8,000 photos out there on mine. Remember? They are, but here's the kicker. Yes. I came here today because I knew there were a lot of important people in this room, including yourself, that a lot of people that I've been explaining my story to, they think I'm crazy. <laughs> so, again, I just needed to connect with more of right people who don't understand you. That's okay. And Very good. Thanks for bringing that up. Anybody else? Yes. The park, Grand Avenue Park. All right, let me get my. The skating in particular. Yeah, 1948, I believe, Milton established the playground program uh, throughout the community. Uh, Homer Folk was a part of that. Bob Iser was a part of that. Uh, and so that was when they started the playground program. Lincoln Street School had one. If you remember, we had one at Marshall Park, <coughs> Grand Avenue Park, Pollock School. And they
they would rotate, you know, the parks. So during the summer, then the uh, 1948 Homer Folk. I don't know if you remember who Homer Folk was. Uh, another one of our historians has passed, and uh, his his hobby was ice skating. And then I guess there were ice skating was quite a popular back then, south of town, uh, in the uh, I don't know what kind of mines they were, but anyhow. So he uh, that was his thing. He loved ice skating. So when he was on borough council, he he saw to it that they built a dam on Le on, uh, on Limestone Run, and they flooded the, what we now know as the ballparks, okay? So they made a flooding system, and they flooded that park, and that became the, uh, the, ice, the ice skating. Then, of course, we also closed Brown Avenue Hill. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you take a look at Brown Avenue Hill, and you say to yourself, how on earth did I ever go down there? Well, we did. <laughs>